if I found him and I was with the other mob guys, unfortunately, he would, you know, he would have been dead because if I, you know, if at, if at that, if at the time we locate him and I can't, you know, extricate myself from that, they're going to kill me. Right. <laughs> everyone, welcome to another episode of I Know This Guy, the podcast where we dive deep into the lives of some of the most interesting people I know. Before we get started, please like and subscribe to I Know This Guy, wherever you get your podcasts. By the way, my kids want me to say something about ringing a bell. What the hell's a bell? undercover today no we are not we're going deep cover and we're going to be talking to joe pistone and leo rossi and if you didn't know this joe pistone was the real donnie brasco they made the movie about him and now both of these guys are going to be on the podcast and we're going to be talking about their life but also their podcast well which is really cool called deep cover the real donnie brasco yeah, I've been checking out their show uh, in preparation for this. It's uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> but you know what? Great dynamic. <laughs> All right. So, you know, what's really cool is that uh, we know the ins and out of what not to do around mobsters now. Yeah. Now I know for sure what not to do. I, I think after this episode, we're going to have the official guide, the IKG guide to what not to do around mobsters. Yeah. Yeah. Straight from the source. Yeah. I think think we've got it. All right. Well, uh, I'm super stoked for this one. Let's let's dive in. All right, guys. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. So, you know, Anthony was uh, teasing me. He was telling me a little bit about you, Leo, how you guys met. And we're going to get into that in a second. But he said, oh, man, you just I can't say anything about this, but... You're going to be introduced to, you already know this guy, and maybe Leo will introduce you. And then when you, when, when I heard who it was, you know, Joe, man, this is so cool. I cannot wait to talk, you know, and get just a little bit more into, you know, your past. It's, it's, how cool is that? Joe is, if I could make the old commercial, Joe is E.F. Hutton. When he talks, everybody leans in. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> they don't want to miss nothing right right i know uh, this is you know i get excited for podcasts but this one i am really excited to, to get into so especially the podcast is based on people's backstories like i just want to know about people this started out just talking to my friends and saying well you know this is kind of interesting why don't we let the world know about what you're doing and each time I'm I'm notching up, I'm notching up. Now I got some really cool backstories here, so we can get into that right now. Sure. Uh, I hope it don't disappoint you. Yeah. So do you want to draw straws or something like that to go first, or I'll, I jump in whenever Leo, Joe gets tired. Leo's the lead. Leo's the lead, <laughs> man. Well, why don't we start, Leo? Let's let's get into your backstory. Yeah. So where did it all start? What makes Leo Leo? Well, first of all. You did say that you're doing this type of podcast, but you're going to go into podcasts about the failures of people. Yep. So call me when that happens, too, will you? Oh, and this is on this podcast, by the way, so get ready. Oh, okay. All right. Good, good. No, I come from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and if you buy, believe in that, then I'll, I'll say you some swampland down in Florida, you know. At uh, But uh, it. it I was, I had a radio show in college, so it was rock and roll. And, but I never, because I was on a football scholarship, I never had the guts to join the theater. I could just see me on stage, you know, and all the, all the mama Luke's on the football team. Hey, Ross, how you doing, pal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I stayed away from that. And then I went into business with my father and when he passed away, I said, what do I really want to do? And I packed my bags and uh, went to New York. And so that, you, 
you had the acting. Yeah, acting was acting was what it was about for me. I enjoyed the means as much as I did the end. You know, I see now these kids that don't they don't have a technique. They they don't have any strong foundation, you know. Oh, there's some fine ones out there, no doubt about it. But everything everybody wants it, you know, right now, now. And I studied with I did study with Lee Strasberg, yes, I did. You know, Milton Kitsellis, Peggy Fury. It, it just you, you know, when you know what you know, then you're not daunted if you're acting with Bob De Niro or some young actor. You know, you just pitch in, you, you know the what you're doing, and I am blessed. And Joe and I got into producing. He beat me to it a little bit. And then writing, too. Uh, he, how many books, Joe? Me or you? You? No, me. <laughs> me was the, the only book I had was with the bookie down the block. No, no books. That's nine. 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 Wow. Books. Yeah. Yeah. And we did do, which one of the highlights, because I love the theater, we did do a one-man show that Joe and myself and Bobby Moresco wrote. Bobby Moresco, he won the Oscar for writing Crash. And he's a dear friend of ours. And, you know, we pitched it to Joe. And we always knew there would be, because it was a one-man show concept, we always knew there would be one point in time where Joe would ask us, well, who's playing me? <laughs> and, and it did come down the road. Right. And he did acquiesce. And, you know, I talk a lot. Joe don't talk much. So, uh, <laughs> no, after it was, <laughs> it was a challenge. So, after, you know, after I, I had first met Leo, right, I knew I knew Bobby Moresco because I had a TV show one one season on CBS called Falcone. And Bobby was one of the writers and producers. So Bobby and I were friends and he introduced me to Leo. This is what. 23 years ago. Yeah. After the meeting, Bobby says in New York, he's from the West side. And so he, you know how direct he is. So he says, well, what do you think of Leo? I said, you know, Leo, I like you a lot, but you fucking talk too much. <laughs> he, 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 he said it. Did he? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh, <laughs> but it, that, it's a 20, 22 year friendship. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I still drive him nuts sometimes. And he reciprocates, believe me. He is so fastidious in everything he does. And being on time with Joe is like being late. You know, it's like, what are you doing? Well, I'm here. We got two minutes. You're late. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's very well prepared. And he's got a great sense of humor. Sometimes can be as dry as you can believe. <laughs> you, you don't catch it till you're out the door and say, was he breaking my balls? Or was <laughs> <laughs> But it's fun. It's, it's been a, a nice ride. And now that we're doing a podcast together, it's been heaven. We really found a niche that Joe could really talk about all the heaviness that he lived through. Mm -hmm. when he was in deep cover and we can still have fun too. So that's what we do. Yeah. That's what's the name of that podcast? Oh yeah. Well, good, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's called deep cover. The real John Donnie Brasco <laughs> deep cover. The real Donnie Brasco. It's on Spotify, all the Apple podcasts and jam street media too. So, you know, you can uh, find us anywhere. And Joe comes up with some things, not only just respect them even more and more, but that'll curl your hair. Believe wow. me. Yeah. He, wow. he just didn't uh, talk the talk. He walked the walk. And, you know, guys, we're also going to be putting in links and we're going to talk about the podcast during this podcast as well. You know, one thing you didn't say, like you said, oh, yeah, I got into acting, but you've been in over a hundred films. Yes, I categorize them as the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and, and nobody starts out to make crappy film. Yeah. But, but my Lord, sometimes it do turn out that way. You know? Uh, one thing, Leo. Yeah. It may have been a bad movie, but you never had a bad acting day. And, and I don't say that, you know, lightly. Thank you. You know, I, uh, I give it my all. You know, yeah. Joe and I 
we are so on the same page with attitudes. It's life's too short. And when people come in with these attitudes, man, well, I've seen Joe, you know, dress people down yeah. who, uh, you know, were pulling attitude stuff. Although the one guy that Joe and I thought, oh, my God, the director wanted him. And I said, this is going to be a nightmare. And Joe and I were producing the movie. And we, oh, no, no. And I'll let Joe finish the story. It was Tommy Lee. Tommy who Lee. Who the drummer for, oh, I don't know, one of the biggest rock. Motley Crue, wasn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and he was married to Pamela Anderson. So take it from there, Joe. I'll tell you, what a gentleman. I mean, a real gentleman. It was funny because the first time I met him and – he said, I'd like to hang out with you. I said, you want to hang out with me? <laughs> I, said, I, I said, you're the most famous drummer in the world. Did you want to hang out hang out with me? But, I mean, he was he was delightful to work with. On time, never missed a beat, never not took direction from the from the director. And uh, <clears throat> but he was Tommy Lee. So <laughs> we were shooting in Pittsburgh. We had a big warehouse that we made into a nightclub. And it just so happened that next door was a strip joint. Right? So it happened to be Bobby's birthday. Bobby the director, yeah. was, the, was the director. So when we're shooting at night, all the scenes were at night in, the, in our, in our uh, club. And about 3 o'clock in the morning... <laughs> In comes Tommy Lee with six strippers <laughs> for Bobby Moresco's birthday <laughs> and had him dance for his birthday. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, what a gentleman. I mean, you know, he was what with us for two weeks, Leo, I guess, maybe. Yep, about that. Yep. And not a, not a lick of problem. Mm -hmm. And whenever his call time was, he was there. Yeah. 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 And he did a good job acting wise. Too. He, he did, yeah. He did, you know. It's just, and you see the other side of that where actors make demands and they, you know, sometimes I, I say, well, now I know why actors get bad reputations, you know? Some ridiculous <laughs> thing. I'll tell you somebody, and I won't mention it in the name John Lovitz. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> I, I did a movie with this guy. And, you know, it wasn't a big budget. So you had a lot of interns running around and stuff, you know. And we're sitting in the director's chairs waiting for a shot to be lit. And he goes, oh, oh, oh. You made it sound like that. And I, What's he doing? And one of the young interns come and he holds his cigarette up. He said, light this. <laughs> God. And I went, I, and I was waiting for the punchline. And the kid let it. And he said, I get out. And I went, did I really see that? Did you just do that? Did, did, do you know how demeaning that is? He goes, ah, eh, you got to rattle their cages. I like to rattle him. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, I was going to say, did you kick him in the nuts? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> on the other side of that, I worked with Johnny Depp. More of a gentleman. I can I cannot say enough about what a gentleman he was three and a half months shooting Donnie Brasco. Treated everybody equally, everybody with respect, never never demanded anything from, from the crew. You know, I mean, so that's the other side. You know, he of, stood up to the director once, didn't he, Joe? Yeah, he did. Yeah. 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 yeah the director got on a, a on a, one of the actors for flubbing his lines. And Right in the middle of the scene, I mean, after the director tore into the actor, he told me, he says, you know, he said, I don't want to hear you talking to any actors like that. He said, I flub my lines and I don't hear you dressing me down. He said, so I don't want to hear it, you know. And there was some other other instances on 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 the movie where on some breaks, they wouldn't let the extras out of the uh, off the set because it was it would have been hard to you know, to re redress and everything. And when he found that out, he said, you know, anytime there's a break 
and I leave here to go get some water, they better leave here and go get be able to get something to drink. I mean, yeah, he, yeah. So I don't have anything, nothing negative to say about about him yeah. as far as on the set. Yeah. So, Joe, we haven't really touched on you at all, and there's been some reference to Donnie Brasco. So why don't we get down that you are what the movie's all about, Donnie Brasco? Well, I was an FBI agent, actually, for 27 years, and I was uh, lucky enough to do some small undercover roles, my first assignments, and I was successful. And I think the reason I was successful is that I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. And I don't know if you know anything about Patterson, but, you know, Patterson was a blue collar town, not far from Philly, grew up in the neighborhood. So I had what I like to refer to as street smarts. You know what's going on in the street. You know how to, you know, you know how to deal with people because that's that's how you survive on the streets. So that made me successful in in my early undercover operations because I knew street people. I mean, look, I grew up with guys that eventually became wise guys, guys I went to high school with. Their fathers were wise guys at the time. You know, they were mob guys, mafia guys. So none of that really impressed me, number one. And number two, I didn't have any beef against gangsters. You know, you stay out of my way, I stay out of your way. And that's the way it was. And I think when you work undercover, your attitude has a lot, a lot to do, you know, a lot to do with your success because you're not going in in there with the vengeance or you're not going in there with an attitude. You're basically going in as a law enforcement agent, agent, you know, to do your job, collect evidence, you know, hopefully get an indictment and hopefully put them in jail. So I worked in some of the some of the tough cities, Jacksonville, Florida, back in the day was like the wild, wild west. You know, that really. Oh, yeah. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, Jacksonville was a tough, tough city. Uh, And then from there, I went to New York. We know how tough New York is. (laughs) I actually worked in Philadelphia. So, you know, my education, though, was before I got into the FBI as far as street smarts. And I think that helped me out a lot, being successful in all my undercover operations. I had most of my operations were long term, deep cover. So I had just come off a year and a half operation. It was out of Florida where I infiltrated a group of thieves that stole high high end automobiles or high end tractors. And we had our own chop shop, stole them, stole them off the lots. You came to us and said, Hey, look, uh, I want a Mercedes. All right. What color do you want? What do you want in the interior? What extras you want? We go to the Mercedes dealer and, and hook it at night. And I did that for a year and a half. And then I got back to New York and my supervisor, an old timer, well, he wasn't an old timer then, but it was, he was a New Yorker by the name of Guy Barada who had done undercover work in his day. I had an idea about Start an operation, go against fences that were dealing with the mafia because there were a lot of hijackings, a lot of high end loads were going, probably losing six, eight loads a day, which is, you know, that's tractor trailers, a lot of money in each one. And the idea was to try to infiltrate the fences and then get to the mafia. Well, it so happened that (laughs) I never infiltrated the fences, but I got to the mafia first. I got the first family I ran with was the uh, Columbos out of Brooklyn. And then I got into a beef with two guys, uh, two Colombo guys, which resulted in physical confrontations. You kicked somebody's ass, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. I did I. <laughs> so I, I couldn't I, I couldn't run with these guys anymore because it would have been it would have come to probably me killing them or them killing me, one of the two, because I I did, as Leo said, kick one of the guy's ass. Then I, I hooked up with the Bananos and was with the Bananos for better part than five years. And it was a total six-year operation. And I was successful enough that I was proposed for membership in the Bonanno family, become a, become a made guy, a mafia guy in the Bonanno family. But there was a shooting war going on in the Bonanno family for control of the family. I was in contract to kill 
kill one of the guys. If you saw the movie, three guys got killed. Well, there were supposed to be four guys there. One guy didn't show, and I had the contract to kill that guy. I came close to finding him. I never found him because he was on a lamb anyway. So that's when the FBI. Oh, Joe, what would have happened if you found him? Well, it depends on the situation. You have to know a little bit about the mafia, Norman. Mafia, you don't turn down a contract. Your boss gives you a contract to kill somebody. You say, okay, yeah, no matter if it's your brother, your uncle, your father, you got to accept it. Otherwise, you get killed. I tried to find him. I couldn't find him. The FBI tried to find him. They couldn't find him. But if I found him and I was with the other mob guys, unfortunately, he would, you know, he would have been dead because if I, you know, if at, if at that, if at the time we locate him and I can't, you know, extricate myself from that, they're going to kill me. Right. <laughs> and I ain't dying for a gangster. I'll take my shot with the government. Right. And we, we did a pretty good job at the mafia. We kind of dismantled the mafia. I think we had a 240 some convictions testified in, I think, 17 trials. We pretty much brought the mafia across the country to its feet because I worked in uh, Miami, Tampa, New York, Milwaukee, California, Las Vegas. In fact, I at one point in time, I was offered the job by the mob to pick up. The, that's when the mob was skimming out of Vegas. And I was offered the job to pick up the skim from Milwaukee, I mean, from Vegas, and take it to Kansas City to hand off to the mob guys in Kansas City, because then they distributed it to all of all the families. That was, you know, when the mob was really tight into Vegas. You know, I made a mistake early on when Joe and I started hanging out together. I said, so you were undercover with the five family. No, 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 no. Undercover is one thing. Deep cover is another thing. Explain, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, undercover is you go into the office every day, you do your regular cases. You might, you have an informant that knows where some, you might be, you might be working drugs. You might be working stolen commodities, whatever. You have an informant that, that knows somebody, you know, that you can, he can put you with. So, you know, either you buy the drugs, he introduces you as, you know, who knows what, but you're supposed to be a bad guy. After you make a couple of deals, you arrest a guy. But, you know, you go home every night, you go into the office, you, you have other other work. That's that, that's undercover. Deep undercover is you come up with a new identity. You never go into your office. You don't carry any identification that identifies you as an FBI agent, all your identification is in your undercover persona. You move out of your house, you got your own residence, you got your own house. And once you infiltrate that group, that's your whole existence socially. You don't have any contact with your family except by telephone. You might get home once every six, seven months to see them. And that's deep undercover. Uh, you only have one individual within the organization that you deal with, that you pass on your your information to. And that's what most people can't do because most people don't can't deal with gangsters on 24-7. Yeah. And that's what you're doing, you know. It's a different mental outlook. You're going to have a different mental toughness to go into long-term deep undercover because you're by yourself out there with the gangsters that you infiltrated. So talk about a method actor. <clears throat> yes. Oh, oh, yeah. No, he's Olivier. Believe me, <laughs> he, he is Olivier. This guy, forget it. There was no, when I flub a line, they yell, cut. He flubs a line, it's bang, bang. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And, There's no retakes in, 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 in deep <laughs> undercover. But what are the chances that they could, all right, so nowadays might, is probably a lot different than before, but I'm sure they're going to do their research on some new guy that's just you know, coming in, what are the chances of them discovering that? Well, the chances are, you know, the chances are very good, but that that's why before you go under, you, you it, there's a lot of preparation, mm -hmm. you know, and you've got to know your target group. You've got to know everything about that organization that you're, that you're attempting to infiltrate because knowing their 
do's and don'ts will help you infiltrate. Plus it'll help you keep you alive. One example, when I go back to the, to the beef I had with those, those two guys in the mafia, the mafia has, and, and, and every criminal, every criminal group has rules and the mafia has rules. They, they tell you how to, how they want you to dress. They tell you, you know, no long hair, no beards, no mustaches. So I guess I'm out. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you can't, you know, things that'll get you killed, insulting a mafia guy in front of other people, physical laying your hands on a mafia guy. And when you're in these type undercover situations, you're going to get into beefs. You're going to get into verbal confrontations because everybody doesn't like everybody. I mean, it's not a kumbaya world, you know? So you're going to get into confrontations, physical and verbal. And what you have to remember in, 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 in the world, there are two things, maintaining your respect and maintaining your credibility. If you leave, lose your respect out there, you're done. You're done. So when you get into a beef with somebody and you know that he's a mafia guy, you can verbally go back and forth but you can't go over that line where you insult them because then he has the right to go in and, and get permission to kill you mm. and take a step further. What else will get you killed is you can't physically put your hands on a mafia guy. So obviously, you know, in, in a lot of situations that verbal confrontations going to lead to a physical confrontation, he gives you a slap. You can't do anything. You got to stand your ground verbally and take that slap because once you lay your hands on them, you're done. You're done. So there are a lot of things you have to know about your group in that, in that situation. I knew which guy wasn't a made guy, which guy wasn't, you know, he was just like me. So that's the guy that I slapped, you know, uh, that I punched. And now if I had punched the other guy, then they would have just, you know, he had the right to kill me on the spot. So there's a lot to go into into making up your bona fides and, 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 and your legend. And now it's tougher because of the internet, you know, there's got to be something with somebody's name on the internet. Right. So it, it takes years to, to build up a good, a good resume. You know, we're going to have on our show coming up, we did have a little bit of it in the first season. Mm -hmm. Joe has the tapes and they're all, you know, it's, it's all been cleared. Most of the people in prison for life are dead. And we play the actual tapes of Joe when he was undercover. And it's fascinating, you know, and he's accepted just like one of them. They confide in him and everything. But I will say, you talk about restraint. I don't know how Joe, Donnie Brasco, <laughs> strangle, kill, shoot, lefty Ruggiero. I don't know how he did lefty. Just tell them who, what Lefty does. Just as it, every it, day. it, it took all I, could, all I can muster. <laughs> the guy, he's one way, you know. That 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 was Lefty. Everything was about Lefty, you know. There wasn't anything that wasn't about Lefty. But he was he was a good teacher. He taught me more about the mafia than I ever knew, and than anybody else knew. I'll give you an example. He had a root canal done. And man, for a week, all I heard about was his root canal. <laughs> it just so happened about a month later, I had to have one. It, it was like, didn't make a bit of difference. You know, <laughs> I mean, was, I can't even explain it. I mean. Uh, and Joe doesn't smoke. And Lefty oh smoked my like God. Oh. Oh God. <laughs> he smoked English ovals. And we'd be in Miami, Florida, and he didn't like air conditioning. You couldn't have the air conditioning on in a car. And we'd be driving around Miami with no air conditioning. And I turned the air conditioning on. He turned it off. I turned, you know, and then he's besides that, he's smoking English ovals <laughs> one after another with no air. And it's, I mean, it's all about him. Oh, my God. And the tapes, when you hear, Joe paints a vivid picture of Lefty, you know, uh, in all the situations, because he was the one that really taught Joe a lot, right? It's when you say, well, I wonder how Lefty would sound. 
I, I, this is a bad imitation. But when you hear on the show the, the, the real thing, Donnie, 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 what do I got to tell you, Donnie? How many times? <laughs> Give me a fucking Donnie. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's I don't know how he didn't kill him. So, you know, Joe, you were talking about, you know, when when you're talking to – a mob guy. I mean, you had to take a slap in the face. You had to sit there and you had to just take it and eat it all in. Leo, did you find that in acting when you were working with some act when you're breaking in, you had to take a bunch of crap, you know, from other actors or producers or directors. Yeah. You know, look, I'm, I used to be six two. I don't know if I'm still six two and you know, but what directors do, not all of them, they can't go at one of the lead actors or one of the big. They find the weak link, and then they unload on that person. And I'll never forget, early on in my career, you know, a director was unloading on this guy. You know, as an actor, he was having trouble lines and then hitting his mark and everything. And it was like, I just said, you know, why don't you leave him alone? I mean, you know, you only make him matters worse. I got a call from my agent when I got home at night. He said, what is wrong with you? I said, what the hell do you mean? He said, you, were, you, you told the director and in front of that, that he, you, you, you showed them up. He said, he was the only kid. He said, you're not your brother's keeper. You got it? You want to survive in this town? You're not your brother's keeper. So consequently, I had to pull back when attacks were made on other people. And I did not have many attacks at me directly. If a director wants to do the psychological game with me, I'll play with it. Okay, you know, he says something. Jeez, I thought you were Italian. I thought all oh, Italians were good lovers. You kissed her like you were kissing a uh, wall. Okay, I, I can deal with that. All right, so, you know, but when they cross the line and they get really into something, you know, that, that breaks the line. But you still, it's very difficult to stand up for other actors, you mm. know, tough. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a, look, you know, there are things where if you were doing a scene with an actor and there was a Canadian actor, I won't mention his name, Nick Mancuso, um, <laughs> who, who, we had this big intense scene in Stingray. I was, I, I was blind Vietnam vet, and he was this and that. And usually, the characters, you know, you're off stage when it's the other guy's close up, and then he's there for you when it's your close up, and that's the way the etiquette of acting is. So we had this big five page scene and everything. You know, he had his close up. And then we were filming in Vancouver. And then it came around because they got a relight and it came around to mine. And I see the script girl there with the script. I said, Where's Nick? Oh, no, he had to catch the flight back to LA. He could. See? Bob De Niro wouldn't do that. Bob De Niro mm. is there for you, Jody Foster is there for you. I mean, the pros are, are, they want you to be good so that consequently the whole scene works. You know, it's, it's, oh man. I mean, Anthony Hopkins, just the, the good ones want you to be good. Right. And get the most out of you. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So I got a question for both of you. This is going to come off weird, I think, but it's for both of you because I, I, I want to play it up to acting. And so, Joe, you're undercover, you're deep undercover. Leo, you, you're going and you're becoming a, let's say, a mobster, okay? So you're learning. At any time, do you guys ever go, wow, I could cross over and do this? Like meeting, for Joe, you meeting over, like meeting and learning about not just LaDonny Brasco, but any, any of the roles that you played, did you ever go, wow, I'm close. I, I could convert. I could cross over. I I never thought I I thought I I could make a good gangster. Yeah. But it never. It never came across your mind that to go the other side. Yeah. Never. 
Do you, do you know a lot of people that when they're, because it seems to me, if you start seeing the lifestyle or the money or whatever it is, people might be drawn in. And that's why I also wanted Leo to, to talk about this as well, because you're studying, you're learning about it. And all of a sudden, like I know in, in a lot of mob movies, they'll actually bring the mobsters in to, to play certain roles. And then now you're schmoozing and, okay, maybe this would be an interesting career change. Yeah. Have some guys gone over? Yeah, exactly. Sure. But, you know, the guys that I know, very few, very few in, from my agency. I mean, I can count on my one hand. And I can't tell you how many thousands and thousands of undercover cases we had over the past 30 years, but I can count on one hand how many guys went over. But I found that these were guys that didn't grow up on the streets. You know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't, they didn't know the life. Look, before, you know, before I went into Naval intelligence, before I went into the FBI, I mean, you know, I grew up on the streets, you know, I was a bartender, I, I played cards, I shot craps, you know what I mean? So none of that stuff, none of that stuff was enticing because I, other than being a thief and everything, you know, like I say, I gambled, you know, I went to the racetrack, I went to, you know, backroom crap games down in the neighborhood. So no, uh -uh. Yeah, with a, being an actor, it's a fine line because I mm -hmm. like to get deep into the character and I do know guys that are in the life. And it's like I, I never ask questions that I know is going to either or tell me something, which I don't ever want to know, right? I did once I was riding in a car with a mobster. He's on the phone, ba -ba 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 -ba, but he's driving this and that. And then ba boom, ba boom, boom, right? He's he's doing it real slick. Like, uh, no, you did what you did. Now you don't. But he's not really putting himself in, in line, right? So he hangs up. Now, I'm dying to ask him what's going on, right? And he turns the radio up. And he goes, he won't make it to Easter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he didn't it. mean the services. <laughs> yes, he didn't mean missing mass. No, oh. you know. So, yeah, it's it's a dicey line. But even in acting, I, I mean, everybody's got an ego. I have an ego, but you know, I, I that's not why I was in it. And I, I think Bronx Tale, Joe, that was a, that told a story of who was the hero. Was it the mob guy with the pinky rings and all the respect of the neighborhood? It was the father. It was the father. What did the father do for a living? Drove a bus. I drove a bus. He was the hero. Because, uh, you know, it's uh, it's easy to, you know, cat around and, and find it. But, yeah, people seem to like it on the screen. I always thought that the mob movies became – the westerns because they weren't making westerns anymore and it's the you know the, the, the outlaws and the rule of the west and, oh now joe joe you, know, you, you know, like westerns you would like westerns you know everybody thinks it's it, it's a glamorous life because it, it 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 shows that on tv right and the movies i mean these, you know, I don't watch much American television, to be honest with you. I watch all foreign television. But you see these guys, everybody's dressed every day in a suit and tie. I mean, that's ridiculous. They're in palatial offices. I mean, you know, our social club was the bar, you know, or the or a candy store. I mean, <laughs> and every day you wake up thinking, is it today I, the day I go to jail or today the day I get killed? That's that's what you wake up thinking. And every day's a hustle. Every day's a hustle about money. I mean, it's like it's a wonder more of these guys don't have ulcers or, or to go into deep depression. I mean, really. I mean, everything's everything is everything is a hustle every single day. And and Joe, Joe said something that when he said it, I think it should be put. You know, if you go into a social club or something, right? It's mob guys. You cannot do what to them? 
You can't embarrass them. <laughs> Unbelievable. Can't embarrass them. <laughs> can't embarrass a mob guy. Wow. So how'd you guys meet? Through that Mr. Bob Moresco. Yeah, Bobby oh. Moresco, who, as neat and fastidious as <laughs> Joe is, Bobby, well, even when he went, when he was up for the Oscar and he won it, and they give you your own Pierre Cardin, they, they, they fit you because they want you to have, a, you know, that their look. And, and you're, I swear he looked <laughs> like he had got the suit at Robert Hall. He, it was, it, it just, it was, and then Joe was with him in London and they were having, what did he come down wearing? Yeah, you know, you know how prim and proper the, the English are, right? So we're in a in a high class hotel, and uh, we go down for breakfast. And I mean, I had on sweatpants, but uh, you know, and a, and a top, a jacket, but nice. <laughs> he goes down the ripped off t shirt and ripped off jeans, not jeans, shorts. Ah, the guy said, "Are you staying at this hotel?" <laughs> oh, man. Ah, but you gotta love Bobby. Huh? Yeah, but we yeah. met we met through Bobby because, as I said, Bobby was a writer and producer on my TV show. We were in New York, right? I mean, in in California, writing and everything, and he needed uh, a role for a, a lawyer, a mob lawyer. And Bobby had cast Leo, and that's that's how that's how we met over it. Actually, at Bobby's office, Leo came over to read the script and everything. So that's yeah, it. yeah. yeah it's um, it's interesting. A big thing in Hollywood is when you're done a project. Okay, all right. Well, listen. Well, when we're back in town, we'll do lunch or, or we'll get <laughs> we'll yeah. You never see him again. You know, and some of them you, you never want to see again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. But Joe and I just, you know, Italian backgrounds and, you know, he Patterson. I was born in Trenton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. They have on one of the bridges. Trenton makes the world takes. Mm -hmm. Uh I mean, you got Patterson, Newark, Trenton, Camden. Oh, my Lord. You want to go get killed someday? Go to Camden. No, that's not right. It's changed, I think. Oh, maybe not. (laughs) Not that much. (laughs) Not that much. (laughs) <laughs> oh gosh but yeah it's been a good ride i'm, yeah. I'm blessed i tell you, we 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 uh, did a couple shows up in toronto i love toronto i'm just two hours north in a place called innisville by barry just on the lake yeah all right yeah i think i've spent five years of my life if you want to put together all the different things in canada oh really vancouver toronto. to calgary to uh, Toronto, you know? Toronto's a great city, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah. They used to call I it hate- uh, New York North, right? That's what they used to call it, yeah. And Hayden's in Montreal, so he's a... Uh... Oh, Hayden, I got to ask you, babe. Hayden, I did a picture in Montreal. Who are the people in Montreal kidding? They want to be secede from Canada. Where are they going? They're going <laughs> nowhere. <laughs> It's just all a front, man. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I have a I, the, the one thing I did miniseries in Cold Blood based on the Truman Capote mm. with Anthony Edwards, Eric Roberts, and oh Sam Neill, right? And we were trying to recreate Kansas in the fifties, so we were in Calgary, and we drove about oh I don't know maybe a, an hour outside of town. And we come across this this town, right? And I go in and I look and I went, oh, I got to talk to the production designer. I go to the production designer. I said, you, this is just the way it is in the book. This is incredible. I said, congratulations. He said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, some of it is, uh, is you know, <laughs> Calgary, you know, Alberta beef. Yeah, I got it. I tell you, though, I did the go. The the show. <laughs> Is it really? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, oh, no. no. I just oh, beef. Sure. <laughs> but I, I will say that I went to the Calgary Stampede 
That was unbelievable. Oh, my God. You, the best cowboys in the world, man. And they have buck, buck races, you know, with the thing. And I think the one year I went, Sam Neill took me in. It was like um, people die falling off of horses, getting trampled and everything. But it's I'm so glad I had a chance to do it once. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Did you get to see the stagecoach race? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was, that's dangerous. That's dangerous, yeah. Yeah. But it is. And, you know, the cowboys from Argentina and, and Italy and all this. Oh, okay. It's just not, you know, our cowboys and stuff. Like Calgary. It was wide open. Yeah. Wide open, yeah. But, uh, oh, yeah, good memories. Good memories. Thanks for listening. That's the end of part one. Make sure to tune in later this week to hear the rest of the interview. As always, make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. It keeps you up to date with all things I know this guy and helps us grow the show. Anyway, that's enough for me, and I'll see you next time.